Welcome to the Department of Public Service EV Make Ready Program Workforce Development, Development Webinar. I'd like to start by thanking today's presenters from NYSERDA, Livingston Energy, and Charger Help, as well as our attendees for taking the time out of your day to be part of this webinar. My name is Jen Robertson. I'm the Transportation Lead in the Department's Office of Markets and Innovation, and today we'll be discussing workforce development in New York as it relates to electric vehicle charger deployment. The EV Make Ready Program is a Public Service Commission's flagship investment in electric vehicle charging infrastructure here in New York, unlocking the use of ratepayer funding to support the infrastructure needed to install enough charging stations to meet the state's EV deployment goals. To make the pro program as effective as it can be, the Commission directed uh, that staff undergo a midpoint review process to explore potential program changes. Uh, the team at staff released a white paper in March of this year that detailed recommendations to improve the program, one of which was investigating ways to support EV charging related workforce development efforts in disadvantaged communities. This idea received notable support in written comments of commenters suggesting that DPS staff work with NYSERDA on this topic. So we hope this webinar today will show some resources. Oh, can you please mute if you're... Uh... We hope that uh, today's webinar will serve as a resource not only for us at the department, but also for representatives of disadvantaged communities and for the Make Ready Programs community of EV charging developers, as well as the approved contractors on today's call. There is some great work already happening in this space that we're excited to share with you all, and we hope we'll, you'll be inspired to, uh, to get involved. So from there, I'll kick it over to our agenda for today. Um, so first and foremost, the team at staff myself will go through an overview of the midpoint review, fairly brief. Uh, and then I'll kick it over to our colleagues at NYSERDA that will undergo an overview of NYSERDA's workforce development programs. We'll have a very brief question and answer period at, at this time to go through any clarifying questions. Uh, we'll then kick into a case study presentation by Livingston Energy Group, a presentation by Charger Help, and then a broader question and answer period at the end of the, the webinar today. If you have any questions, please use that chat function within WebEx. Uh, we'll keep track of questions as they come in. The team at staff is, is taking notes, and uh, we'll try to, uh, to answer those questions on a first-come, first-served basis. If you can please introduce your name and your organization when you ask a question, that makes it a lot easier for our note-takers to keep track of who is saying what. And uh, for our own record-keeping, we really appreciate just knowing who's, who's asking the question and what organization you're representing. If you're on uh, WebEx as an attendee, you'll, we'll, we'll remain muted until the dedicated discussion periods. During the discussion periods, we'll take a look at the questions in the WebEx. Um, if you want to use that raise hand function, if you prefer to ask your question verbally as well, we'd, we'd love to hear your voice and hear from you directly. Um, this session is, is being recorded, and the presentation materials will be posted on DMM for this proceeding after today's webinar. Do you have any um, Questions, want to learn more about the Make Ready program or anything kind of came up that you want to be in contact with, with staff regarding, uh, you can email us at ebsc at dps.ny.gov. And um, these materials will also be uploaded on DMM with our, our email. So I'm going to start us off today with just a very brief overview of the midpoint review. As a, a probably a refresher for many of you, that we have the Make Ready program, which was authorized in an order in July of 2020. This program is a $701 million budget um, that supports primarily infrastructure needed to install electric vehicle charging. Within that $701 million, $206 million is dedicated to disadvantaged communities specifically. The budget size to support 850,000 zero emission vehicles by 2025. And this has looked like around 50,000 level two chargers and 1,500 fast chargers being developed through the program. The, uh, the program also includes pilot programs for medium and heavy duty and transit authority make ready. Uh, it includes fleet assessment services as well as clean transportation prizes. So, but the majority of the programs really focus on this hard infrastructure. If you look towards the right here, we have a, a graphic that basically shows the type of infrastructure funded by the program. Utility side infrastructure that would support EV charging is included, any sort of upgrades that, need, that needs to happen within the utilities right away and, and property, um, as well as customer side infrastructure. So kind of handling, conduit, trenching, permitting and design, step-up transformers, wiring, kind of all things needed to, uh, to get those chargers in place, but not including the charger itself. The program does not fund um, EV chargers or software or network and maintenance or signage um, at, at this point in time. So it's definitely focused more so on the hard infrastructure needed to, um, to install charging. There are three incentive tiers um, that cover eligible costs within the program. Up to 100% of eligible costs are covered if it's a a charging station development that's supporting a, a disadvantaged community or serving a disadvantaged community. Up to 90% of eligible costs are covered for public non-proprietary chargers. 
and up to 50% of eligible costs are covered for private access or proprietary technology. We're in the midst of, uh, of wrapping up the midpoint review of the Make Ready program. The Make Ready order directs the staff to uh, evaluate the budgets and incentive levels, as well as redirecting underuse funding at the midpoint of the program. Uh, the midpoint review white paper was filed in March 1st of this year. It proposed an incremental increase of $407 million to the Make Ready incentives based on updated plug forecasts and additional information, new information on additional plug needs statewide. And we also made recommendations for disadvantaged community investment, uh, proposing to increase funding for disadvantaged communities to of 35% of the proposed budget to be consistent with the uh, goals and, and mandates under the CLCPA, the, the Climate Act, um, that we're all working within in New York State. There's also a, a proposal for $30 million of additional medium and heavy duty make ready fi pilot funding, a $25 million micromobility make ready program, as well as increasing eligibility for curbside charging. We also asked stakeholders really specifically for feedback on workforce development, which is the, the subject of today's conversation. And this is to note, we received written comments on May 15th of this year and reply comments on uh, the 29th of, of May. And I'll go through this pretty quickly. This is just the timeline of where we are within the midpoint review. So uh, we had the make ready order back in 2020. The uh, midpoint review commenced back in August of 2022. And then 2023 has been super busy for us. We got the white paper out in March of this year. And then we had several tech conferences, one doing an overview of the overarching midpoint review, one on disadvantaged community specific investment, uh, one on data reporting, uh, another on plug and, uh, and budget goals and uh, the last being workforce development, which we're talking through with you all today. And this last slide on, on the overview here, so just to, to note some of the stakeholder feedback we received from the, uh, the white paper on workforce development, we heard a lot of strong stakeholder support to leverage NYSERDA's existing experience managing workforce development programs. Stakeholders recommended that workforce programs be geared towards operations and maintenance of chargers, due in part to the longevity of those opportunities compared to installations. The work that the recommendations that the workforce program funding allocations not reward or punish site hosts for participating in the make ready program for labor issues out of their immediate control. And that the program design not include onerous requirements requirements that render many disadvantaged community residents ineligible to participate. Those were the, the main uh, stakeholder comments that we received from the white paper. I'm, I'm really looking forward to the discussion this morning to learn more about NYSERDA's offering and to hear um, the questions that come up from the attendees. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'll hand the floor over to Nyserta. Great, thanks, Jen. Let me get my slide deck up. Uh, do you see my slides? Yeah, it looks good. Great. Um, so hi, everybody. Thank you for joining today. I'm Laura Giannini with the Nyserta Workforce Development and Training Team. Uh, and today I'll be providing an overview of uh, the range of workforce development and training programs that NYSERDA offers uh, to support workforce development in the clean energy industry across the state. Oh dear, wrong button. Um, so uh, as an overview, NYSERDA has dedicated more than $170 million in funding to support clean energy workforce development and training. Uh, and as part of this, we have a focus on supporting disadvantaged communities uh, to comply with the Climate Act mandate that no less than 35% or shooting towards 40% of our climate action benefits uh, those disadvantaged communities. So through the workforce development and training programs, NYSERDA funds initiatives that prepare new workers for clean energy jobs. We support initiatives to provide new and advanced skills for existing workers in the industry and support businesses in hiring and training workers. Our initiatives are geared towards supporting clean energy businesses, job seekers and students, training providers and community partners, and building owners and property managers, as all of these um, uh, entities play a role in, in workforce development. So I'm going to start with uh, providing an overview of the hiring support programs. This is a portion of our program portfolio that's intended to help clean energy businesses uh, grow their workforce and train uh, new, new workers to, to meet the needs of the industry. So there's three programs under this program umbrella. Uh, the first is the Clean Energy Internship Program. 
and NYSERDA provides funding for eligible clean energy businesses, organizations, and local municipalities to hire interns uh, to gain industry and professional experience uh, in the clean energy sector. The Climate Justice Fellowship Program uh, provides funding for year-long full-time fellowships with a dedicated focus on uh, hiring fellows from priority populations and uh, work within organizations that are advancing climate justice and clean energy priorities for disadvantaged communities. Uh, and lastly, the On-the-Job Training Program uh, provides funding for uh, energy efficiency and clean technology businesses to hire and train uh, new full-time permanent workers uh, across a range of positions in the, the clean energy industry. So a little more information on each of these three programs, starting with the internship program. And I will note there's a lot of information in this slide deck and there's a lot of nuances about each of these programs. I'm gonna go through this relatively quickly. I'm um, happy to take questions and clarifications in the Q&A section. And these slides will also be available uh, posted as Jen mentioned. And there's more information on the NYSERDA website as well. But as an overview, uh, starting with the internship program, uh, eligible employers are businesses, nonprofits, and municipalities that provide services uh, related to our eligible technology categories, which does include alternative transportation. Uh, interns who are eligible to be hired are New York State residents currently in college or recently graduated, um, students and recent graduates of New York State colleges, as well as members of priority populations or disadvantaged community members. Uh, priority populations, uh, to clarify that, we have a list of categories um, that's available on our website defining what we use uh, in terms of a definition for priority populations for our programs. This includes things like uh, low income, um, individuals with disabilities, uh, justice involved individuals. So in addition to the disadvantaged communities uh, location based definition um, that New York State uses, we also support uh, individuals based on other demographics as well. Um, so the internship program provides funding uh, on a reimbursement basis for to cover those intern wages. Uh, we'll provide funding of up to 90% on intern wages, uh, up to $17. Businesses can pay more, just the nice sort of reimbursement is uh, capped um, at that $17 an hour wage. Um, but businesses will get either 75 or 90% of the intern wages covered uh, to, to support and, and train that intern. The program has been open for, for, for a few years and we've uh, supported over 1,800 interns to date. Uh, next up, the Climate Justice Fellowship Program, uh, as mentioned, is focused on allowing community-based organizations and other organizations uh, advancing climate justice and clean energy priorities in disadvantaged communities. Uh, funding for um, full-time fellows, and this funding is $40,000 per fellow, uh, with a portion going towards salary and a portion dedicated for uh, other supportive services, depending on what um, is needed to allow that individual to be successful in their position. Uh, additionally, NYSERDA provides uh, leadership and professional development resources uh, as part of the fellowship program as well. And lastly, the on-the-job training program uh, is focused on clean energy businesses who provide services within our, our te focused technology areas and electric vehicle charging stations are, are on this list. And this program allows businesses to hire New York State residents who are new employees for the employer. And NYSERDA will provide funding uh, between 50 or either 50 or 75% uh, of the new hire's wages for a training period of either four months or six months, depending on if the, the new hire is a, a disadvantaged community resident or priority population. We do partner with the New York State Department of Labor on this program, and they uh, assist us in the process and provide support for hiring to participating businesses. Uh, we've supported over 1,600 individuals to date, uh, and I will note the average incentive per business uh, for new hires is around $9,000 per new hire, uh, but depending on some of the eligibility criteria, it can be up to, to $20,000 per, uh, per worker uh, for participating businesses. Uh, so we have had um, good participation in our different programs across the state. Um, we'd love to get more businesses involved in taking advantage of uh, these funds um, that are available to help you grow the business, bring new workers into the industry. 
so I wanted to speak to how these programs are designed to uh, support and encourage the hiring of priority populations and residents of disadvantaged communities, as well as uh, supporting program participation by minority owned, women owned and service disabled veteran owned business enterprises. Uh, each of the programs has some, some provisions or additional incentives. Uh, the on the job training program provides um, higher incentive tiers for businesses when they're hiring these these targeted uh, populations uh, and funding is available um, for larger businesses only if they're hiring these priority populations and residents of disadvantaged communities. And thanks to that uh, program to date um, over a third of the new hires uh, have been priority population members or residents of disadvantaged communities. Uh, the Clean Energy Internship Program um, has some more flexible eligibility requirements for the interns, and the Climate Justice Fellowship Program is really dedicated to priority populations and uh, project work that's focused on um, initiatives that benefit disadvantaged communities. So um, just to talk through some of the funding criteria for the on-the-job training program, because I expect that uh, in particular may be of interest to some of the businesses on the call. Uh, funding for a new hire is based on uh, the position type, what technology they're working in, and um, EV charging infrastructure would fall in our general clean energy category. Uh, the employer classification, uh, whether it's a minority or women-owned business uh, or not. The employer size and the worker category. So for example, uh, a general clean energy business that's not an MWBE or SDVOB with two to 100 employees would get 50% of that new hire's wages covered uh, for either four months or six months through, through the OJT program. And again, the, the length of that reimbursement period is based on if the worker is a disadvantaged community member uh, or, or not. Uh, similarly, as I mentioned, larger businesses um, uh, can only participate in the program if they're hiring disadvantaged community members and priority population uh, workers. And again, getting that 50% uh, wage reimbursement covered for uh, six months. So how to participate? Because um, we'd love more businesses to sign up and take advantage of this funding. So there is a two-step application process. The first step is for businesses to register as an eligible employer. This is a one-time registration application, and it's a single application for all three of the hiring support programs. Uh, this application can be submitted at any time in advance of hiring. Um, we look at uh, business location, confirm that you meet the eligible technology categories, and there's a due diligence review with the DOL as part of the process. And once a business passes this uh, one-time registration application stage, uh, they're granted access to the application portal to submit applications for individual new hires. So if you think you're interested in this program tomorrow or six months down the road, go ahead and apply today. You can get your registration application in, get that process started and out of the way, and that can speed things up um, when you're ready to actually hire. Uh, so that second step of our two-step application process is individual applications for each new hire, intern, or fellow to be hired. Uh, each program does have specific application procedures and documentation required, so I encourage you to look at each program uh, webpage and documentation individually. Uh, and also one tip is to be mindful of the deadlines to submit applications relative to when those employees are starting. Each program does have a cutoff point. You need an application in um, no later than a certain point for us to be able to award funding uh, for, for that um, new worker. Um, this is a quick snapshot of the online application. Uh, we do try to turn these around uh, pretty quickly, two to three business days uh, if everything is, is in order. Then that due diligence review phase can take another um, two weeks roughly. And then um, applicants are uh, receive a response if they're um, eligible to participate in, in one or multiple programs. So gonna go through the section relatively briefly, um, but the process for the internship program, um, I did want to note that we do have a directory of intern candidates. Intern candidates looking for uh, clean energy internships uh, apply to the program through an online form, and employers get access to, to resumes from these candidates to, to help in, in hiring. Um, employers can also find their own intern, bring them to the program. They still need to submit an application to get into our system, um, but we do have that resource of, of intern candidates available with several hundred intern candidates at any time in the directory. Uh, and then just want to stress um, that first step in the process is just to be eligible for the programs in general. You do need to submit individual applications uh, to reserve funding for each individual internship. 
and an application includes a job description, a signed offer letter, uh, and general details of, of the internship. Um, the deadline for internships is applications must be submitted to NYSERDA no later than 30 days after the intern start date uh, for us to review the application and award funding if everything's in order. Um, I'm not going to go through all of this here in interest of time, but the internships can be up to 480 hours uh, within a 12-month period, flexible schedules um, that work with the intern and the business. Uh, and then it's... Um, Reimbursement is paid out on a reimbursable basis. Uh, employers submit payroll records showing hours worked and amounts paid to the intern, and then NYSERDA will process those reimbursement payments uh, based on that documentation. Uh, the Climate Justice Fellowship Program um, also has a, a, a way for fellow candidates to apply, and employers can look at fellow candidates through, through our directory for this program as well. Uh, and employers can also bring their own fellow if they've identified their own candidate um, as well. Uh, this program has an email-based application, which is different than the other two, um, for the, the fellowship stage. Uh, the application includes some application forms, the job description, and some specific details on the salary and benefits uh, that will be paid to the, the fellow. Uh, these applications must be submitted to NYSERDA before the fellow starts with time for kind of fine-tuning the project and contract execution. So if you're interested in the Climate Justice Fellowship Program, I encourage you to reach out to the program team early in the process uh, to kind of understand what is needed to get everything in order. And lastly, the on-the-job training program. Um, we Fortunately, don't have a full directory of uh, candidates for full-time positions, but employers can identify their own candidates or use uh, DOL resources through a dedicated business service representative that you're paired with as part of your participating in the on-the-job training program. Uh, workers must live and work in New York State to be eligible to be hired and supported through the program. How it works, um, employer develops a training plan. Uh, the DOL helps with this part of the process. Um, and the DOL does need to sign off on that training plan as part of the application. So that's some of the upfront work. Um, and then you make the offer to the employee and then uh, submit a online application to NYSERDA that includes that signed training plan, the job description and details of the employment. The deadline here is applications must be submitted to NYSERDA no later than seven days after the new hire start date. Um, so again, this program is designed to support full-time hires. And once the new hire starts working, the employer implements that training plan that was submitted as part of the application. And this program is also paid out on a reimbursable basis. Uh, employers submit invoices for reimbursement. Uh, that's payroll records showing the hours worked and amounts paid. Uh, and just to reiterate that deadline, um, the applications must be in no later than seven days after the first day of work. So employers will need to start working with uh, the DOL in advance of their start date to get the paperwork in order. Um, this is what a training plan looks like. It's one to two pages, um, nothing too, too crazy, um, but it does need to be a specific thoughtful approach um, of how the employer is going to bring their new worker up to full productivity during the course of their on-the-job training program. And there is an example training plan on the NYSERDA website if you're curious to learn more. Um, so I wanted to flag, we will be having questions uh, at the end of this presentation. Um, and that we can cover um, clarifications for anything I've, I've mentioned so far. And we also have uh, office hours um, that are the third Thursday of each month, which is an opportunity to speak directly to program staff and get your questions answered. Um, so there is a link on the program website where you can register for these monthly office hours and feel free to, to drop in um, and, and get your questions answered or, or learn more. Um, shifting gears a little bit, I wanted to cover our workforce capacity building programs. So what we've been talking about so far is our kind of direct to business hiring support programs that's one worker at a time. Uh, another significant portion of our efforts focuses on building up the training infrastructure and the resources across New York State related to, uh, to clean energy training and, and new technologies and supporting the workforce and, and industry. So our primary funding opportunity for that is the Energy Efficiency and Clean Technology Training Program. Uh, which is a solicitation that provides funding for technical training, uh, experiential learning, job placement support, and supportive services 
uh, to help the, the industry grow and make sure there are new workers and existing workers with the right skills to help New York State meet its, its climate goals. Uh, this is a competitive solicitation. Um, awards range from $50,000 up to a million dollars per project. So these are our larger scale training initiatives. And again, they must have that technical training component for, for all projects. Uh, and then other, otherwise projects can include hands-on experience, job placement services, uh, other elements to, to round out um, how this training project is, is really meeting a market need for, for training that might not otherwise be available either in this location or on this topic or, or at this scale. Uh, EV charging uh, infrastructure is an eligible technology uh, for, for this funding opportunity. And applicants uh, can include technical high schools, community colleges, uh, training organizations, uh, and other, other types of organizations, and oftentimes partnerships between, um, between these organizations to, to develop um, kind of comprehensive projects. Uh, so just to give some examples of the types of initiatives and activities for which NYSERDA funding may be used under this funding opportunity, it can include curriculum development, uh, training delivery, equipment purchase, uh, hiring and training of trainers, um, mentoring, internships, pre-apprenticeship programs, uh, and that job placement component is really important for, uh, for new worker training. So we recognize um, that that needs to be part of a project and, and can support job placement services uh, as part of um, a career pathways project. Um, and oops, before I go on, um, and I will say that these projects um, are uh, geared towards supporting uh, disadvantaged communities, particularly for, for that new worker training uh, category. So when we're talking training of new workers, we require that uh, at least 50% of new workers who are trained in projects funded through this program are priority population members or residents of disadvantaged communities. Uh, so an example of a recent project um, that received funding uh, through this program is with Soulful Synergy, who is providing EV charging equipment installation and managed charging training. Uh, this is, um, I think they started their training last month, so relatively new uh, and gonna be going on for, uh, for the next um, year plus. Uh, it's an online training series uh, covering what to consider when installing EV charging equipment and the proper way to design, install, and operate EV charging equipment. Um, they're looking to train at least 1,000 individuals um, across a range of different uh, industries. So maybe new workers to um, the EV charging industry specifically, as well as property managers, municipal employees, or facility engineers who may be interacting with, with charging infrastructure um, as, as part of their job as this infrastructure um, gets introduced to their, their facilities. The sessions will cover electric transportation basics, site feasibility, uh, charging equipment installation and managed charging. And uh, these trainings will be offered in both English and Spanish. Um, if you'd like more information on this particular um, NYSERDA supported training project um, or to register for an upcoming training, uh, the link is on the bottom of the slide here. Um, and then one other project we wanted to spotlight to show how NYSERDA is supporting projects um, to prepare disadvantaged community residents for, for in-demand jobs. Uh, Youth Action Program and Homes uh, developed a building operators training program uh, in New York City focused on preparing um, individuals brand new to the industry uh, for entry level jobs, uh, working as building operators and in the energy efficiency um, industry. So this was a partnership with CUNY Building Performance Lab and o Association for Energy Affordability and combined classroom training, hands-on learning, some certifications and wraparound services that help prepare these workers for, uh, for the, these entry-level energy efficiency jobs. Um, this project trained 27 um, New York City youth and um, awarded certifications for those who uh, went through the training and resulted in a mix of, of paid internships and full-time job placements after uh, the in the first few months after the training. Um, so with that, that was a ton of information, um, but I think I'm just about on time. So that means we have a few moments for uh, some clarifying questions on anything, anything I covered today. Um, 
we also have a lot more great information on the website, um, nicerta.ny.gov slash WFD. And uh, you can reach members of our individual program teams directly uh, at these email addresses above, or there's a general WF info at nicerta.ny.gov um, mailbox as well. Uh, so, yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you, Laura. Just uh, a quick reminder on, uh, on the Q&A. If you do have a question, please feel free to use that hand raise feature at the, slightly at the bottom of your WebEx um, if you'd like to uh, unmute and ask us a question uh, verbally. Um, if you would prefer to put it in the chat, uh, please please do so. Um, if you can also include your name and organization in, um, in both your verbal and, and written questions, it makes it a lot easier for us on a, a tracking note. Um, I, I do see we have one question in the chat, so I could read it out loud and we can take a, a crack at, at answering it. So I, I see here, um, it reads, I am RT Mehta, uh, project manager at Purge Advisors in New York City. Which stakeholders the team reached out to for comment and inputs? So I, I think that this is um, in reference to the, the midpoint review. Um, so the first touch point we had with stakeholders regarding workforce development was actually during a, uh, a technical conference that took place in December of 2022, I believe that was December 1st, uh, where we had a few different organizations that opined on the, the need for workforce development for disadvantaged communities specifically. I believe it was Push Buffalo that, um, that spoke to, um, to that specific need. Uh, we then had uh, a comment period in regards to our white paper, and we had a number of stakeholders that responded. Um, in written comments, we had a combination of Charger Help, um, who was presenting later on today, uh, Franklin Energy, uh, the Joint Utilities of New York, South Bronx Unite, as well as Livingston Energy, which will also be presenting um, after this brief Q&A. Um, so we got written comments from a few different organizations. Uh, we did have also been reaching out to um, disadvantaged community uh, representatives uh, throughout the midpoint review process, um, both offline and, and, and via email, um, in order to, to get a, a fuller breadth of uh, feedback on this concept. Um, and, and hopefully today is kind of part of that that story within the review. So definitely um, hoping to hear more from, from representatives today and, and afterwards on, um, on any feedback you have regarding workforce development. The, um, the recordings for that December session, we also had a, a session in April that was specifically looking at disadvantaged community investment as well as the recording for today's session will all be posted on DMM. Uh, my colleague, Lindsay Wiener, put that link in the chat. Um, so if you click on that link, um, all the material should be up there for the previous sessions. Uh, there's also a button at the top right where you can subscribe to, to the case to um, kind of keep track of, um, of materials as they're posted and, and webinars and technical conferences and other white papers and other engagements. So definitely uh, encourage all those who are interested to, uh, to subscribe. Hopefully that, that answered that question, RT, but please let us know if, um, if, if not. I'm looking at just the next uh, question from Michelle. Can you kindly share these slides uh, at the conclusion of this presentation for reference? Thank you. And, um, and we definitely will do so. My colleague, Lindsay, again, put that uh, information in, in the chat, so you should be able to follow it on that, that link. I see that Dwayne put a few uh, links in the chat as well um, in reference to some of um, Laura's presentation. I see Cal Truman writes, the regional clean energy hubs can also help these program applications. And then I see another question here uh, from Sue Sani, co-founder and CEO at Dollaride. Um, the question reads, would a fleet manager who's responsible for managing a fleet of electric vehicles and their charging needs qualify under the OGT program or other workforce development programs? And, and maybe Laura, can I kick that question over to, to you please? Yes, yeah, happy to. Um, thanks for the question. Um, so the OJT program of the three that I talked about today has the narrowest focus on um, the, the eligible technology list. So um, the EV charging infrastructure and associated positions falls under what we can support for the on-the-job training program. Um, electric vehicle fleet maintenance typically is not something that falls in the on-the-job training program uh, list, um, although it can be supported by the internship program, depending on what, what the position is. Um, I think what you're describing is a mix of charging and vehicle maintenance, um, so that one might need a closer look of what, um, what the person would actually be doing and kind of reviewing that and against the fine print of, of the technology definitions. If that makes sense.
yeah, I think that is good. Yeah, it's an important important clarification. Um, again, and some slight variation between the programs related to the technology types. Thank you, Laura. Yep. Um, so I don't see any other questions, um, and I think there is time at the end. So if anything else occurs to anyone else um, as we move forward, I'll I'll be around at the end of the presentation as well. Great, thank, thank you, Laura. And, and also, Greg, not seeing any other questions come through, maybe we can kick it over to um, our colleagues at Livingston Energy next. Great. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. yes. Okay, great. So hello, everybody. Um, thank you for inviting us to join and share our feedback on the program um, and the benefits. Uh, Livingston Energy Group is an energy tech innovator. Uh, we are committed to transforming how the world connects clean, renewable, and sustainable energy solutions with the evolving electric infrastructure. Uh, we are unique in the industry because we deliver solutions for every component of the entire electric vehicle charging ecosystem. It includes turnkey deployment services, domestic manufacturing, uh, equipment installation, software engineering, energy asset integration, grid development, network operation and management, grant funding, project financing, and public education and outreach. Uh, we have hired employees and interns through NYSERDA's hiring support program, um, which has fueled our growth over the past few years. Uh, few existing um, candidates and employees in the market um, have industry experience. And therefore, there is this need for training with most hires that we're seeing. And it can present hurdles for a company, as I'm sure that many on the call have experienced. So here are some stats from you know, our experience with the program. Um, we, the programs have supported our business by you know, bringing new workers to the clean energy jobs that we have. Um, not only that, but there's existing workers out there with a specific skill set that are entering the clean energy jobs and they need help and training. Um, so I'll focus first on the internship side. Um, as you can see, we've had our fair share of uh, interns. Um, the internship program is really fantastic because it introduces new work, new workers to clean energy jobs. And what we've found is that with NYSERDA's program, the candidates that sign up for the program are, are passionate about the industry, which is wonderful. And it adds to our work culture where, you know, most everybody here is, is also passionate about it. it. We've also found that it opens a fantastic door to a career for people that you know they wouldn't have they wouldn't have thought that they had had. Um, so we've used the internship program pretty extensively for the on the job. We've noticed that we have um, had some employees that we've looked to hire that have um, some skill sets, but they have no prior experience in clean energy jobs, specifically with EV charging. Um, so similar feedback on that program as well. You know, people who want to participate in this program are passionate about this industry and want to learn and immerse themselves in it. And this gives them and us the opportunity to bring them up to speed and, and you know, fully immerse them in this industry. So to tie that all kind of together, um, I wanted to mention, too, like the, the benefits of the program is that, you know, as, as an organization, as a business, um, hiring individuals who do not understand the industry, training is incredibly important and it's time consuming. So one of the, the next um, best things that Laura spoke about was the training program, the training series with Soulful Synergy um, to help businesses train the incoming staff on electric transportation basics, site like feasibility considerations and things like that, which is the next program that we're hoping to add to um, our tool set under this program to help, you know, educate these new hires that we bring in. Um, I lastly want to just touch on a couple of individuals with our organization to kind of talk about the evolution um, 
these two individuals started with us under the internship program. And uh, I messaged with them separately this morning because as I was looking at uh, you know, their life cycle here from intern to where they are now, it was incredible. So Madison, for example, she started here as a sales intern. Um, and then she started learning about all the different funding opportunities within this industry. Um, and she started learning all about that. Um, and she quickly, you know, since she became the knowledge that the expert on the funding programs that were available, um, she became the lead for that within our organization. And then I realized that she actually trained and brought in more interns through the program and taught them about the industry and, and brought them through our organization as well. And today she's our RFP and incentive programs manager. She's built a team. Um, she's open to learning every aspect of the business and the industry, and she takes on new challenges and she thrives. So this is a, one great example of um, total success using the internship program. Um, the, other, the other example, um, the other person on here is Nicole Bader. A similar story, she joined as an intern with the internship program. She, we allowed her to learn when she joined as an intern. She learned all about the company, what we do here. She found the area where she felt she shined and she had the best background knowledge or education. And she went from a service and support specialist as an intern to now our partner success manager. Um, she's interacting with organizations from all over the globe um, and helping them integrate with our network and get a variety of different charging stations out there in the public. Um, she has also helped train incoming interns and be successful here. So just another great example of how you know, an internship turns into a career. Um, and I think that that's, that's super important and, and these tools, these programs are essential. Um, to summarize, with any new and developing industry, programs and funding that support businesses are essential and we appreciate the support that these programs have provided um, to not only us as a business, but also these individuals who have entered into this industry and now they have a career. And also all of the individuals that are going to join this industry and need this kind of support and program to help them along. It's very, we think it's very important. We're passionate about this. We also work with BOCES and local colleges to, to add new programs in this industry so that everybody that's incoming will be successful. So these programs are fantastic. We thank you very much. Um, we plan to continue to utilize them and are, are happy to see what's to come next. Great, thank, thank you, Tanya. Yeah, if anybody on the call wants to reach out um, and ask me about experiences with the programs and tips and tricks, I'm happy to share those. I really you know, think that the more that we can utilize the programs, the better. Thank you. Michelle. Looking at looking at time, we're just going to keep um, keep moving stuff along here, um, and I can pull up the the slides for um, Charter Help. Just give me one moment, please. And I see Samantha Ortega, you're you're on the line. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, sounds good. Very good. I I have your slides up. I can share if if you prefer. Please let me know, um, but I can do so if you'd like. Yes, please go ahead. Thank you, Jennifer. So, hopefully that's working. And uh, just let me know next slide, and I can click along here. Very good. So, good morning, everyone, and and thank you very much for having me today. I'm really thrilled to share with you the work we're currently doing in New York. My name is Samantha Ortega, and I'm State and Federal Government Affairs Manager at Charter Help. And first and foremost. We are an electric vehicle charging reliability management company, but we're really supporting the growth and training of a new local workforce. So I'm very thrilled to and excited for today's discussion. Next slide. 
Now, to provide some insight, Charger Health was founded by two women in early 2020 in Los Angeles, California, and it was created to help address these two key issues, which are chargers that remain consistently broken over long periods of time and the lack of diversity in the clean tech industry. Now, Charger Health takes a unique approach to electric vehicle charging reliability by integrating field service and our technology platform and power that allows for the company to identify and continuously monitor common issues. So providing transparency and efficiency to helping address these issues more quickly. And Charger Help also takes a diversity centered approach to traditional workforce development to achieve equitable opportunities, specifically for folks in disadvantaged communities. So as organizations began to reach out to Charger Help to host trainings, it was really important for Charger Help to establish partnerships that had the same mission and flexibility to provide the specialized new opportunity. Next slide. So we opened our uh, training to allow for stackable certifications, including Charger Help's proprietary curriculum. We partnered with safety centers and manufacturers to provide a comprehensive training curriculum to, to, for incoming technicians. So to date, we've trained over a thousand folks, uh, technicians in, internally through Charger Help and the workforce development partnerships in the diagnostics, maintenance and repair of these unique public and privately funded IoT assets. So really through the intersection of technology and adult learning, we can leverage the new generation of marketable EVSC technicians. So Charger Help has conducted multiple uptime assessments uh, campaigns and have consistently seen an average of 30% of the charging stations being inoperable at any given time. So when Charger Help technicians go out to survey these charging stations, they are ensuring that these stations are reliable, but they that also the stations as a whole is operable so that EV drivers could have a good charging experience. Next slide. Now, so when we look at the skill sets and responsibilities, the technicians are servicing these, you know, large computers that require technical understanding of the interoperability of the software, firmware, and hardware. Technicians are able to solve communications and connectivity issues. So upgrading chargers from 2G to 3G, 3G to 4G, software troubleshooting and reprogramming parts, cycling the breakers, commissioning chargers when they are ready to go live and supporting charging station owners outside of the warranty coverage of the equipment. If they purchase, of course, warranty. And so you'll see here some of the um, additional uh, tasks that our EVSC technicians conduct as well. So um, uh, communications testing and resolution, hardware and software troubleshooting and upgrades, swap outs of level twos, parts replacement, um, general uh, preventative maintenance, and even you know outside of warranty services. Next slide. So Charger Help currently provides a foundational training program that is designed specifically to educate individuals new to the EV ecosystem on the industry in general, opportunities they could encounter, they learn Charger Help's uh, curriculum, they receive safety certifications, including OSHA and NFPA, they learn defensive driving training as they are in, the, in this occupational class independent and have to be responsible while driving for work. Additionally, they receive three manufacturer certifications. Now, at the end of the training, the trainees will complete a capstone project consisting of visual assessments of local public charging stations. They leverage uh, public platforms like PlugShare to locate the charging stations and apply what they've learned in class. So they're also able to survey between five to 25 charging stations that week that they're completing the capstone project. But when they are on the field, they're looking for uh, general the general state of the charger, the site if the site has graffiti or vandalism, broken screens, uh, infestation, uh, lighting accessibility or availability, among other things. Next slide. So Charger Help has partnered with an organization called Block Power beginning in December of 2021 to provide this foundational training on EV charging station maintenance to hundreds of people in Brooklyn. Our partnership is part of the larger program where Block Power is dedicating 
uh, city funds to train approximately 1500 people, particularly within communities experiencing gun violence and training in the areas of HVAC, Wi-Fi, electrical, and other decarbonization projects. Now, so the, through the Civilian Climate Corps partnership, the students that participate in the three-week program are pre-recruited to ensure they fit the ideal candidate profile. We conduct small cohorts of 12, between 12 to 25. And this program specifically gives students the opportunity to explore different occupational classes. Um, and that's really important, having that flexibility. Students leave with the confidence to seek jobs that are in the field of maintenance or other adjacent tech jobs, which could include manufacturing, dispatch, network providers and manufacturer liaison, logistics management, and even electric vehicle maintenance, and really aiming for the long-term good paying green job. So just going beyond this, we found that there was a huge need for recruiters who can be the gatekeepers of these jobs. Uh, to also become knowledgeable of the opportunity that they have at hand and, you know, are able to recruit that ideal candidate. Now, we also have to consider different pipelines of recruitment. We think it is crucial that uh, these programs are flexible enough to support different areas. A bit different than in New York, we've hosted workforce development trainings in Atlanta, Georgia as well. Uh, if you can go to the next slide. In this particular instance, the foundational EVSC technician training was offered to students from Atlanta Technical College, uh, leveraging the existing local workforce or local partnership rather with other organizations like Georgia Power's Workforce Development and Education Customer Solutions, Supplier Diversity, and Electric Transportation Arm. This created a unique experience for the students who at the time were in programs learning to service electric vehicles. They were already studying emerging technology, so this program allowed for them to expand their knowledge on other occupational classes and job opportunities. This training also includes the capstone uh, program, which includes the visual assessments of the charging infrastructure and, and in the field experience. I think more importantly, giving this flexibility allows for, again, in the individuals from these communities to explore other interests, utilizing um, a local pipeline to, uh, for the long-term maintenance of charging stations that are owned and operated throughout the state. Now, after conducting several of the uh, charging infrastructure, um, serving the charging infrastructure, it was clear to Charger Help that, you know, 30% of the charging stations being inoperable was not sustainable. So this led us to working with our customers to ensure that they had the resources to troubleshoot these common and frequent, frequent failures. We did this by providing reliability as a service, uh, which is leveraging a service level agreement to have consistent communication, coordination, and dispatch technicians accordingly, where we provided unlimited truck roles to site hosts and charging owners. This is, you know, of course, not only necessary necessarily accessible for owners or property owners that purchase equipment warranty or have had these charging stations for a long time. Next slide. And when we're thinking about uh, programs that are being rolled out, we must consider uh, the role that we have to play to support site hosts, uh, property owners, and equipment owners with the resources to set them up for successful projects. This means thinking beyond the initial deployment, but also thinking about how these site hosts could be supported. We can create more jobs quickly uh, by focusing on maintenance as a core competency. Maintenance jobs should be local and workers need to um, know the market values maintenance of the charging stations. So we continue to encourage the New York uh, state to consider the sustainability of make ready funded charging infrastructure and consider the opportunity and pathways that these type of trainings provide to um, local communities. And happy to answer any questions. Um, you can go to the next slide and I can leave you guys with a picture of our two co-founders right in the middle and some of our technicians uh, that met it at Atlanta uh, Technical College. Thank you, Samantha. Thank you. This is our, our open question and answer period. We have um, Samantha Ortega on from Charger Help, myself, Jen Robertson from DPS staff. Um, I think both Laura and Tanya are still on from NYSERDA and Livingston, respectively. Um, I'll start taking a look at the chat and see if there's any questions there that we haven't addressed yet. 
Um, but please, again, use that raise hand feature. We love to hear from you verbally. If, um, if you have the ability to unmute and ask us a question, we'll keep our eyes peeled for those um, raised hands. Um, feel free to throw questions in the chat too. We'll be reading through those um, I guess in just a moment. Um, and please introduce your name and organization when you do ask a question, whether it be via chat or, or verbally, just um, again, it makes it a little easier for, um, for our note takers. So I'm gonna go to the chat and just go in, in order, read what has come through since um, we last paused. Um, so I see that we have um, from Dwayne Norris. Good morning, everyone. Dwayne Norris here, co-founder of Soulful Energy. As Laura mentioned, we have been funded by NYSERDA to provide e uh, free EV and transportation electrification for New York State workforce. Anyone is welcome to apply here. And then there's a, a link included. And then uh, just a note that the next training is set for September 27th. So um, uh, hopefully that's interesting uh, information for those attending today's uh, webinar. And then um, a, a note from Dwayne as well that Tanya and her team are amazing. Um, thank you, Dwayne, for that. If I don't see any additional questions coming in, we'll, I guess, pause. Maybe people are collecting their thoughts or um, or waiting to um, to raise their hands. So I'll just pause for a few seconds here and stop talking and see if um, any hands go up or if any additional questions come through. Maybe I can get a start. I have a, a question for um, for Samantha Ortega at Charger Help. I'd, I'd love to learn more about your program offering within uh, New York City and um, how maybe the Make Ready program could, um, could contribute or, or be um, supportive of, of your efforts happening within New York State. Um, I wonder beyond, I guess we're, we're connected now and uh, we have this public forum to discuss, but wondering if there's anything specific that you think that we should know regarding the Make Ready program um, based on your experience within New York. Yeah, thank you for the question, Jennifer. And, you know, I, I want to say that historically, um, the maintenance of the charging stations hasn't been prioritized generally throughout the US. And, you know, as, as we had seen uh, funding for electric vehicle charging stations being deployed throughout the years, at least in the last 10 years, maintenance was, you know, usually left out of the, the funding opportunities. But we think that there is so much opportunity in supporting individuals that want to become electricians, become part of this industry. So we think that, you know, specifically the maintenance of the charging stations and this skill set could lead to individuals to, you know, not just maintain the charging stations, but if they have an opportunity um, to become an electrician or to uh, become one of, uh, or to have an opportunity in one of those occupations that I mentioned before, uh, in, in dispatch, logistics management, we know that's going to be really important as well, uh, you know, with the, with the Buy America Act, um, and, uh, of course, the replacement of parts and the local manufacturing, um, dispatching, logistics management, um, liaison, being a liaison is really important and, and it's very instrumental so that you know, site hosts can have someone that's knowledgeable of, of what is needed to maintain the charging station, that perhaps the utility of their owning charging stations, large fleets of their owning charging stations, that they have someone knowledgeable in what it means to um, maintain the charging stations and also what it takes to, to make a program successful, uh, especially uh, when so much funding is coming um, to the infrastructure of the, of the charging stations. I guess another question I have, and I'd be curious to hear from all the presenters on this, um, we definitely would be interested in hearing your thoughts on the greatest barriers to clean energy workforce development in disadvantaged communities. Um, we on, on our end have um, attempted to engage a variety of organizations. We started to work through the clean energy hubs and through our colleagues at NYSERDA as well to um, kind of streamline our engagement, but we're always learning to, uh, always looking to learn more on how to better engage disadvantaged communities. I would say in, in general, but specifically on workforce development, what are the greatest barriers that you're all seeing and um, what are your programs or, or your um, initiatives or um, the way that, that you're doing workforce development? How is that addressing those, those challenges? And I'm open to any responses, but maybe I don't know, Laura, if you don't mind taking a first crack at that, then we can hand it over to Tanya and Samantha to take um, a go at, at it as well. 
you don't mind? Sure, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think I'm glad you mentioned the um, regional clean energy hubs. Um, that is a um, program that's supported by NYSERDA that is supporting uh, groups of community-based organizations and other um, kind of local stakeholders across the state, really focused on kind of the needs of their region. And workforce development is a, um, a component of that. So they are, uh, to some degree, the, the boots on the ground um, helping with career awareness, um, letting people know, hey, there are jobs in this field. I mean, in many cases, um, just the, the industry is competing with lots of other industries for attention and, and people getting interested in signing up, raising their hands for these jobs. Um, so the regional clean energy hubs can help with awareness um, and then providing some of those connections to those NYSERDA programs um, in terms of referrals and just letting people know, hey, this funding is out here, this opportunity is out there. Uh, so thank you for, for mentioning that, um, that program. And then just to, to kind of reiterate the importance of the local community-based organizations, I think we've seen some, some success where community partners who are already working with different different groups of individuals um, and kind of are the trusted resource, the recognized name to come to for whether it's technical training or just general supportive services of which kind of job preparedness and job placement can be a part of that. Those, those institutions who kind of are embedded in the community are already doing a lot of great work and helping people with certain barriers to employment connect with those the web of services that are out there and can be difficult to navigate. They're an important part of, of that. And where we come in, I think, is kind of making sure we can make our programs known um, uh, that these resources are available and just kind of make sure everyone's clear on what the, the process and the steps are uh, for businesses and for, for participants. Um, so not sure if that totally answers your question, but I think that um, speaks to kind of where we where we've seen the success and how also this is an ecosystem and kind of working with different different partners whether it's the business partners and these community groups and the schools and, and all of that is pieces of the puzzle yeah i i'll i'll kind of go off next um i agree with laura the community-based programs we've found some success in um if they are aware of the programs and educated on the programs and they have participating organizations that are in the community um, that utilize those programs they can offer it as like a full package so it, it makes it, it easier and um, they can talk about it with those individuals and at different events or if they hear of people looking for opportunities they can channel them in this direction um, we did as part of the on-the-job training program work a little bit with the Department of Labor um, on trying to find opportunities to connect with people. We did do, and this was like a COVID thing, so it was a virtual job fair, which we did not find a lot of success in, unfortunately, and I don't, I'm not sure why, um, but people were at the virtual job fair, but we didn't connect with a lot of individuals. We tried to. Um, we since have not done any in person with them, but that might be another way to, you know, have, um, you know, nicer to with the program information at the job fairs and maybe the community organizations as well, as well as some of the employers. So again, it's, it's more accessible, um, all in one place, one stop shop, you know, when you're trying to pull together a lot of different pieces. Sometimes that can be confusing and overwhelming and some other opportunity that's simpler might be pursued instead of one that appears more complicated. Yeah, and I'll share a couple of barriers that we've seen um, throughout the, the years in, in providing the trainings. Um, first is creating that opportunity for recruiters. And as I mentioned during the presentation, the record, recruiters play a key role in making sure that these jobs become accessible and available for individuals in low-income or disadvantaged communities. So uh, making sure that they feel confident in, in what they're offering and making sure that they're recruiting, you know, that ideal candidate um, is, is, is really important. And, you know, we are, I guess limited in the in what we can do as a company. <laughs> you know, we can we can only hope that 
you know, the training programs that that we're part of also do include that portion, um, though we do, you know, provide um, that training with the organizations that we've been part of, but uh, including that extra component. And I, and I did see NYSERDA uh, present something in one of the uh, programs that they've released in the energy efficiency, um, something like that. Um, so that's one, making sure that recruiters are educated in this job uh, opportunities. Also having that flexibility um, in these workforce development trainings that to say that, you know, these are emerging technologies, these are emerging industries, and how do we create the opportunity for individuals to um, um, try or or try to see if if this is of interest to them. You know, they they won't know if they like it unless they try it. Um, and if it doesn't, you know, is, is there another program that was designed within this program that they can attend that that could perhaps be more into what they're interested in. So those are two um, really key um, issues. I, I I would say the last thing, one of the barriers. Um, that we've seen is recruiting women. You know, we we want women. Our our company was founded by women, and um, and, and I believe we have a high uh, rate of women in our company. And so, when we look at the the technicians that we're recruiting, are we recruiting specifically for for women? I'll, I'll give you an example. In California, in Los Angeles, we hosted the first all women cohort technician. Uh, maintenance technician training in partnership with Tradium Charging out of uh, El Segundo and also the Los Angeles Clean Tech Incubator, and we we were specifically recruiting for that to to show individuals that there is this opportunity and how how can we help you transition into it. So, three major <laughs> three major issues. Definitely, thank you, thank you everyone for opining there. I um. I'll just I'll note as well from from our perspective, we're really interested in workforce development specifically for disadvantaged community residents and within the make ready program and our other electric vehicle charging incentives and and the transition to clean transportation. We um, we know that disadvantaged community residents aren't necessarily um, driving in particular in particular in very dense areas of the state. We don't necessarily want to be driving people into single occupancy vehicles and putting charging infrastructure in, in places where um, they're not being used by local residents is something we've heard a lot from stakeholders as being potentially a, a concern. So the balance of making sure the infrastructure is there once all the cars are, are electric one day, but also making sure we're not just putting stuff in neighborhoods where, um, where they're not used currently is um, something that we always think through within the way that we structure our programs. And I think work workforce development is particularly important and um, and pertinent in kind of figuring out some of these thorny issues and working with local partners and, and um, working through um, getting recruitment to include a, a diversity of, of New Yorkers and kind of all speak to if the EVs aren't necessarily in disadvantaged communities today, that the job certainly can be. Um, so we're definitely really interested in, in working with all of you and, and the folks on, on the call today to get a better understanding of how that could kind of fit into our, our work. And I, I just see a, an additional comment in the chat. I'm going to read it out loud. Uh, it says, hello, all Douglas from Roots of Success and Environment Literacy and Job Training Apprenticeship and pre Apprenticeship Program. Excited to hear about these opportunities. Thank you, rootsofsuccess.org. Thank you, Douglas. And feel free, Douglas, or, or Dwayne, or anyone else um, who put some comments in, in the chat. If you, uh, Thank you for that, the thumbs up. I appreciate that. Uh, if you would like to unmute and add anything to, to your comments or, or share any additional um, thoughts, please feel free to, um, to do so. Thanks so much. No, this is just really exciting to learn about and, um, and it's really great to hear from, from these, you know, business partners and their experience uh, with people that they've worked with. So thank you. Pausing for any additional questions while well, um, I'll we'll pause, I'll, I'll throw our, our email for DPS staff in the, uh, in the chat. Um, I believe we have email addresses for, um, for Samantha and Tanya and, and Laura, respectively, within their presentations, which will be uploaded on DMM. If um, you want to get in touch with anyone from today's conversation, you can feel free to email us and, and we'll make sure you get to the, the right person or um, you can reach out directly with the email addresses provided. Um, everything will be posted up on DMM. That link um, is in the chat as well. 
um, definitely encourage everyone, if you haven't already, to um, subscribe to, um, to the proceeding at the top right just to stay updated as we're working towards a midpoint review order that will um, we'll make some updates to the program. Um, but any additional comments or thoughts, we, um, we definitely welcome via, by email or, or otherwise. Hearing, um, hearing, hearing nothing else, keeping my eyes peeled for those, those hands up, maybe we can just do a, a last round robin for the presenters today. If you could speak uh, just uh, maybe in, in one or two words, kind of the, the greatest opportunities in, in workforce development. I know we talked a lot about the barriers. We've talked a bit about um, the ways that your organizations are, are addressing um, those barriers as well and some suggestions for us to think through at, at the department. Um, but if you don't mind, just round robin any, um, any opportunities that make you particularly excited about um, workforce development within the EV space. I can start off, uh, Jennifer. I, I think it's, um, you know, it's a really interesting um, occupation, right? People are excited. They they really are. And, uh, you know, the first time we um, sought out to to hire individuals, we received 1,600 applications, you know? So it just shows how excited people are. And I think that there is opportunity for growth. And so if if we really look at, you know, the skill sets that is required to be an EVSE maintenance technician and what it, it takes to be perhaps uh, someone that installs the charging station. How can we um, provide that pathway and how can we ensure that, you know, these individuals from local communities have the opportunity to to be able to participate in in, in these different type of um, occupations? And I'll say that, you know, site hosts need to be supported. They, they really do. There's there's miscommunication or it's, it's a fragmented industry. And so what we do through our service level agreements, again, is, is really make sure that there's communication, that there's uh, flexibility, that, that we're um, providing them with unlimited resources um, to, to be able to solve for those issues. So uh, I'm really excited for those two things, you know, creating opportunities and pathways and also helping the site hosts that are going to be um, uh, hosting their the charging stations for for the decades to come. Um, I'm going to chime in with a quick pitch to career awareness um, and just a, a initiative that NYSERDA has been supporting. Um, putting a link in the chat to um, our Road Trip Nation project. Um, so one of the challenges across all sectors of clean energy workforce development is letting people know about the opportunities in the range of careers. They may not, like there's different, all sorts of different elements and different roles involved in making these businesses across the industry a success. And so letting people see the opportunity, understand how they fit in uh, to these, these potential um, careers is, is something we've been putting a lot of thought into. Um, and definitely encourage um, and, and spread the word about um, this Road Trip Nation project. Um, what NYSERDA did is supported a, um, a road trip, essentially, um, in partnership with an organization who focuses on on shining the light on on different career opportunities. Um, three young people traveled around the state, uh, interviewed professionals across a range of different clean energy uh, career sectors, um, and there's a, a documentary and a, a whole host of resources available on the website um, about the the different opportunities um, here in New York State related to clean energy. So. Wanted to, to flag that while I had uh, had you all on the call today, um, because going back to the question, just again, letting people know about the jobs, helping see, letting them see themselves in these jobs, and then understanding the steps to get the training and, and get the connections to the businesses who are hiring is, is so important. Hi, can you hear me? Uh, internet, I think I lost internet briefly. Apologies for that, everyone. Um, I, I heard someone, is that Maude that chimed in as well? That was me. I just managed to get my audio hooked up. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, we had a... a I'm, I'm glad you're back. 
Yeah, thank you. We had a, an internal emergency because I briefly lost internet connection. Apologies for that, everyone. Um, the recording should still be fine. I'm, I'm not handling it on, on my end, thankfully. But um, unfortunately, I think I missed the, the last few few notes that were shared by the presenters, but I'll, I'll go back and, um, and take a look at that in the recording. I won't make you all repeat yourselves because my internet uh, failed for a moment there. Um, apologies, everyone. Um, but I was keeping my eye out for any additional um, additional questions. I see Laura, you put that uh, that link for the the career awareness in the chat. Thank you for doing that. Um, I'll maybe pause for another um, few seconds for any additional final final thoughts. I see Jay Prother dropping after you to a call. Thank you all so much for this in-depth presentation. Great programs and resources. Thank you. Um, thank you, Jay. Hearing no um, additional questions or, or comments come in, again, just keeping my eyes peeled for this last minute, the hands or anything in the chat. I just really want to thank the presenters for taking the time to, to speak with us today. I, I feel like I gained a lot of knowledge on NYSERDA's program offerings and Livingston's specific um, case study example and hearing Charger Help's work um, nationally, really spearheading uh, uh, operation and maintenance workforce development is, has, uh, has been really insightful for me. I'm, I'm looking forward to continuing the conversation with you all going forward as well. Um, definitely, please feel free. If you're an approved contractor and you've just learned about these programs today, I, I hope that you um, reach out to NYSERDA or, or Charger Help or Livingston to learn more about their experiences and their program offerings. And I'm, I'm hoping that this is just the beginning of um, some connections that were made this morning between um, the various groups. And I see one, one more note in the chat from Katie um, Kruk. Livingston, NYSERDA, and many others in the green energy slash EDSC space will be at the Drive Electric Week on October 1st in Schenectady. And there's a, a link to um, to um, to those opportunities. So please, um, if you're in the um, capital region, um, consider making it to um, making it up to that event. Thank you all for your time. I really appreciate it. And um, please be in touch as um, as anything comes up. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.